that are found in many parts of the world. Another one of our most important natural resources is water. More than seven-tenths of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Without water, neither the plant nor the Both my wife, Anne, and I are Londoners, born and bred. The daily excitement of the city, all the old familiar landmarks, the Tower of London, the bridge, hearing Big Ben strike, that's what we were used to. So you can well imagine my feelings when the sales manager called me in and said, Jeff, old man, the company is transferring you up to Wolverton. Frankly, I wondered what in heaven's name we'd do with ourselves up there. But then, we found our new home was just a stone's throw from the Grand Union Canal. And almost overnight, a whole new way of life was opened to us. You see, a great many people in the area are awfully keen on boating. And one day, a friend took Anne and I along on a day's outing. Well, after that, nothing would do but for us to have our own boat. And after a good deal of discussion, we finally decided on a rig that suits us perfectly. Our Merc 350 has more than enough power for our needs. And yet, it is an absolute miser when it comes to using petrol. Since the Grand Union consists of almost 300 miles of canals, I was somewhat concerned with staying on course. You know, navigation, all that sort of thing. As it turned out, though, it's practically impossible to lose your way, because Every junction is clearly marked with directional signs. Considering everything, there's not a more relaxing or leisurely way of seeing the countryside. It is different, no doubt about that. For example, when you mention cruising along at 300 feet, most people assume you're talking about an aircraft. But on the Grand Union Canal, you can do the same thing by boat. At both Wolverton and Halsden, there are towering aqueducts designed to carry water traffic across the valleys, originally built more than 150 years ago. Looking out over the landscape as you cross them is one of the most unusual experiences a boater can have, and most visitors find it quite a thrill. Another unique feature of the Grand Union Canal are the old tunnels of Brownstone and Blissworth. Both of them run for more than a mile underground, and inside, it's so dark that an electric torch is an absolute necessity. The tunnels are ventilated by a series of air shafts which run to the surface. And above ground, they rise to a height of more than 15 feet. And since there's no sign of a waterway about, strangers ask the purpose of the strange-looking smokestacks. Our method of cruising through the canals, being gently pushed along by a modern outboard motor, is a considerable improvement over the technique employed by the old-time bargemen. Today, the circle of light that marks the end of the tunnel is simply another interesting canal phenomenon. But to those chaps who once made their way through on sheer muscle power, it must have been a welcome sight indeed. To enable canal traffic to traverse the irregular terrain, in many places the Grand Union is dotted with locks. And watching the barge folk operate them, it's obviously quite a simple procedure. They hop right to it, opening the bottom gate to allow the water to rush in and fill the lock, then opening the lock's top gate and they're on their way again. Why, it's a piece of cake. And that's why, for the life of me, I can never understand why Anne seems to have such a deuce of a time getting the hang of it. Now, as everyone knows, we British believe in a fair and equitable distribution of effort between husband and wife. Consequently, 
when I first appraised the situation, I immediately deduced that the only sensible course of action was for me, as the uh, captain, so to speak, to take on the major responsibility of manoeuvring our craft, while Anne was to be responsible for operating the locks. Since the locks are so close together, it is quite impractical to keep getting in and out of the boat, so naturally, Anne must walk along the canal, operating the locks. But try as I will to explain to her how the paddles which open the lock gate should be pushed, and despite rather incredulous stares by passers-by, she continues to push them around in her own peculiar style. Really, I shouldn't be a bit surprised if she develops calluses. Once, just for a laugh, to see for ourselves what it must have been like to travel the open stretches in the old days, we rented a horse to pull one of the barges. Naturally, since handling animals is man's work, I led the horse while Anne rode the barge. It was interesting and all that, and I enjoyed the experience, but once was enough for me. The strange thing is, though, ever since, Anne has been suggesting we try it again. Can't for the life of me understand why, since our usual method with me in the boat and Anne walking alongside to open the locks is obviously much more efficient. Odd. I should think she'd see that for herself. To drive in Italy is an adventure in itself. And nowhere is the traffic heavier than in my native city, Milan. Here, for 11 months and two weeks of each year, I work in an automobile plant. My name is Sergio Franchione, and as a master mechanic, I enjoy my work very much. Yet each year, as the time for our vacation comes near, I begin to count the days. And when at last our plane takes off, my wife Gina and I are once again on our way to the place which is to us the most perfect of all vacation spots, the Ioli Islands of Sicily. To reach them, we go by air to Palermo overland to the Sicilian port of Malazzo, and then over the sea by hydrofoil to our destination. Lipari, Liola Madre, the mother island of the Aeolis. Although only a few hours from Milan, with its narrow village streets, so quiet and peaceful, it is like another world. Ah, I swear to you, the beauty of the Aeolis is enough to make a strong man weep. The entire area abounds with creatures of a sort one never encounters on the boulevards of Milan. And the sea itself is equally rich in wildlife. Whether you are exploring its depths or standing on the shore, looking out over its rolling surf. The Mediterranean has a loveliness all its own. I am an aqua tofoso, a water fan. And each year upon our arrival, my first move is to rent a barca or boat for diving. Once our boat is loaded, Jean and I usually head for one of the island's many quiet coves. Then uh, some good cheese, a little vino, and we are off again. How can I describe the feeling? The open sea and the warm sun, a powerful engine and the wind in your face. By this time, I am so familiar with the waters of Lipari that I know where the spear fishing is best. To me, this is the real La Dolce Vita, the sweet life.
On the nearby island of Volcano, with its black sand beaches and its steaming fissures, so hot that one can literally fry an egg over them, one of the things which the women can never resist are the mineral mud baths, which are said to be great beauty aids. If a thing is reputed to increase their attractiveness, whether it be mud, a donkey's milk, or even the juice of a squash, they will try it. And as I observe on Volcano every year, they never give up the fight. While our love affair with the Aeolis has been a long one, many Italians prefer to spend their vacations on the mainland. To Rome every year tourists come from the ends of the earth to marvel at the glory that was once the center of Roman civilization. The Colosseum, where so many martyrs met their fate, and the ancient triumphal arc through which the victorious Caesars once marched. There is also Pompeii, that strange dead city buried so long ago in a volcanic eruption, and now uncovered so that one may walk its deserted streets and piazzas. And of course, there is Naples. What can be said about Naples that has not already been said? Vedi Napoli e Pomori, see Naples and die, is an old Italian saying. But then, I am a young Italian. And while no one loves the culture, the color, and the beauty of Italy more than I, I know that next year, and for many years to come, when the time for our vacation arrives, Jean and I will once again leave Milan behind and fly away to our own private paradise, Lipari, Liola Madre. <laughs> Rita and little Rudy. That is how we are, as you Americans say, built here in Germany. As entertainers, we play mostly the cities, and perhaps that is why we always enjoy so our annual engagement at the hotel here in Garmisch. There is a, uh, a decorative air about Garmisch which I have never seen anywhere else. From the fine hand-carved pump in the village square, to the gaily colored horse-drawn coaches, to the unusual painted walls of the buildings, which cause so many visitors to stop and look twice to make sure their eyes are not playing tricks on them. It is so different from the cities in every way. And yet, nowhere else in our country is one more constantly aware of the source of the Wasser or water upon which so much of Germany's economy depends the snow-covered Bavarian Alps, with the mighty Zugspitze, the highest mountain in Germany, towering over them all. The snow itself is the basis for one of Germany's most important industries, if I may call it so, our winter sports season. The lightning slopes of Garmisch are known all around the world, and every year thousands of skiers come to match their skills against them. But for several months after the official winter sports period ends, it is possible in Bavaria to have the best of two seasons. One can ski in the mountains and then, after a brief cable car ride back down, be water skiing on one of the crystal clear mountain lakes. enjoying a hike in the sunlit green foothills. It is at this time in April, May and June that the great mountains begin to give up so much of their snow. As the snow melts, the water tumbles downward, gathering strength and force 
until the streams below become swollen with rushing water. This is the season the kayakers wait for. And although, to my way of thinking, it takes a light head as well as a light boat to do such a foolish thing, they seem to enjoy it. Only when it reaches the wider rivers below does the water become calm again. Because of its abundance of water, Bavaria is rich in many ways. Franz claims it is almost impossible to cast a line here without catching a fish. From the lush highland plateaus, the water continues downward, much more gently now, in quiet rivers. Eventually, these join other, larger rivers, and it is these which supply the vast amounts of water required by Germany's huge industrial centers. After traveling hundreds of miles, many of these rivers empty into the Rhine. There, day and night, the barge traffic moves up and down the Great Rhine Valley, transporting our goods to the sea for export and bringing back the things we need from other countries. Water and snow, snow and water, separate and yet the same. They are both equally important to the people of Bavaria and to all Germany as well. Most people say that a Frenchman will do anything with water except uh, <clears throat> drink it. But this is not true, since I distinctly remember having drunk several glasses of it as a child. And another equally widespread misconception is that France is Paris. By this I mean, when foreigners think of France, they immediately think of the view from the Eiffel Tower, the Arche de Triomphe at sunset, Montmartre with its altars and so on. But believe me, while as a Frenchman, I, Marius Mouton, am fond of Paris, there is actually much more to my country. For example, since before the days of Charlemagne, Frenchmen have been going down to the sea in ships. And of all the French seaports, there's absolutely no question that my native city, Marseille, is the jewel of them all. Here water, or loo as we call it, is not a part of our culture. On the contrary, so completely does it dominate our day-to-day -day activities that it is a whole way of life. And I'm sure Père Francois will forgive me, a religion. The Great Harbor is a port of call for ships from all over the world. And our local fishermen, who supply so much of our say's food, spend their entire lives on or near the water. Take my Uncle Yves. In the last five years, he has retired four times. But the habit of a lifetime is difficult to break. And each dawn, he still heads out to fish, as he has done for 40 years. But just as he always wears both belt and suspenders when dressed in his Sunday clothes, I notice that the small boat in which he goes so far out to sea is equipped with a reliable mercury outboard. Le Mer is good to those who are patient, and when Eve returns to port, I shall be happy to buy this fine fellow from him, at a reduced price, of course. After all, we are related, and blood is thicker than wine. <coughs> I mean, water. Much of the fishermen's catch will be sold at dark side, either by themselves or by their wives or relatives to the people of the city. But the best will be bought by those in my profession, that of les restaurateurs, one of the most honorable in France. And my cafe, Le Fonfon, has been serving Marseillans and visitors alike with pride for three generations. In truth, when you choose your entree for preparation at Le Fonfon, you may be assured that it has personally been selected at Darkside by your master.
specialty, the house, Bouillabaisse, naturally. Since it is a family secret, I cannot give you the exact recipe, but I can tell you the ingredients. All one needs is some olive oil, onions, garlic, bay leaf, salt, pepper, and saffron. And at least three varieties of fish, French fish that is. Some lobster and shrimp, a generous quantity of white wine, and uh, reluctantly, uh, just a little water. With these things, and a talented chef who has the rare gift of taste with which all truly great French chefs are born, the result is a work of art. A gastronomical delight which in itself is well worth the visit to Marseille. When I told you what uh, was almost a religion here, I was not exaggerating. Because to participate in our favorite sport, les joutes, one must be a very religious man, just in case. The lances used in les joutes are tipped with steel points. And although the participants have a wooden shield for protection, there are a great many Marseillans who have scars to prove that steel is stronger than wood. I once heard a tourist remark that the object of the sport seemed to be for one of the teams to try to drown one another. Actually, whether you drown or not depends on how well you swim. Another sport in Marseille, too. Yeah, probably the most popular of all. And now, if you will excuse me, I've been reading a lot of fine print recipes lately. I think I'll go out for a while and rest my eyes. Voila! It, it's almost three o'clock. I hope I can find an open spot as the fence. Wikinger Oak Van, Vikings and Water. For thousands of years, that's what Norway was known for. Our ancestors, the Vikings, have long since passed into history but the water remains. And for that, we are thankful, since because Norway has no highly developed heavy industry, commercial fishing is the lifeline upon which our nation depends. I'm Christine Carlson, the wife of Jan. Our home is Stavik, far up the northern coast. For weeks at a time, my children and I are alone when my husband Jan is somewhere at sea, perhaps hundreds of miles to the south, helping to bring in the ocean's harvest. With our fish, we supply food for much of the world. And since the waters of Norway are our most important natural resource, we are careful to conserve them. No matter how great the catch may be, the fish taken are always carefully weighed and only the amount which can be processed that day by the shore canneries are taken aboard. Norwegians work hard, whether they are fishermen, farmers, or lumbermen, but we play hard too. Skiing is our national sport, and most of our children can ski almost as soon as they can walk. As you might expect, we are very proud of our Olympic ski teams. Very recently, during the warmer months, our team has taken to water skiing to keep in training. Since to be a member of the Norwegian ski team is to be interviewed by both television and newspaper reporters, great publicity has been given to this activity. In fact, to show the similarity between the two sports, 
One of our stations showed a man on water skis being towed down a slope out onto a lake. like fun, but if you were ever to place your toe into the water of one of our high mountain lakes, I believe you might think twice before trying it. Because it seems like such fun, this new sport is fast becoming very popular. New clubs are forming all the time. Perhaps only when you live in a northern country like ours can you truly appreciate the warmth and sun of summer. And when our brief summer arrives, the green hills and valleys of Norway come alive with vacationing families. Just as our country has its distinctive characteristics, we Norwegians have many individual traits. At least we like to think we do. But I don't think really that we are at all different from the peoples of other lands. We work, we like music, the outdoors, good food, good books, and all the other things that make life a little brighter.